We're going to be looking at uh, Daniel chapter 5, um, which, sorry to me, could, I've actually loaded it to be shown up on the, sorry. I know, I'm sorry. It was nice for you to be able to sit next to your wife briefly. Um, we're going to look at Daniel chapter 5. Um, so, I hope you're up for that. It involves the ghostly hand that starts writing on the wall. Ooh. Go ooh with me. But we're not going to be worrying about that too much. So that's going to be good fun, isn't it? So, um, it's a story, really. What we're going to be looking at is actually the contrast between King Nebuchadnezzar I've always liked that name, Nebuchadnezzar. Don't they just flow beautifully? You with me? Nebuchadnezzar. Repeat with me, Nebuchadnezzar. And I love it because it reminds me of the Matrix, so that's good. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon in his time, was used by God to exile the uh, from Israel from Jerusalem to kick them out, send them into exile. And he also removed uh, the sacred objects from the temple of God and put them in his own God's treasury house. Now that's really important for us to get that for the rest of this story. He removed the sacred objects, put them in, in the treasury house. And this treasury house he would do with all uh, uh, sacred objects that they removed from different gods' temples and put them there. And they just got stored there. It's really important you pick that up for the rest of this story. Is that okay with me? Wonderful. Now, Neb, as I want to short him down to for a minute, um, became very proudful of the kingdom that he had decided that he had created, the kingdom of uh, Babylon became incredibly powerful and actually through the prophet Daniel, uh, as you well know, uh, he was warned that you're going to go a little bit insane because you were so prideful. God's going to humble you, uh, make you incredibly humble and then you will return back differently and worshipping God. And actually I want to read that very briefly. That's not going to come up on the screen, but I just want you to read it. It's in uh, Daniel chapter 4, verse 28 to 37. But all these things did happen to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, he was taking a walk on the flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon. As he looked out across the city, he said, Look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. I think he was a little bit up himself at this point, don't you? Anybody ever done that after you've done some work? I had to do a load of DIY work yesterday and I looked back and I said, wow, that's brilliant. Look at what I've done. Aren't I brilliant? Joy came home from work and went, what have you done today? <laughs> no, she didn't really. While these words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals and you will eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. This same hour, the judgment was fulfilled and Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. He ate grass like a cow and he was drenched with the dew of heaven. He lived this way until his hair was as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird claws. Feeling good and fuzzy right now? When God wants to humble us, we normally say, oh, God's humbled me. Believe you me, this is how God humbles you. After this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity returned and I praised and worshipped the Most High and honoured the one who lives forever. And I'm just going to skip for a moment. When my sanity returned to me, so did my honour and glory and kingdom. My advisers and nobles sought me out and I was restored as the head of my kingdom, was as the head of my kingdom, with even greater honour than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honour the King of heaven. 
all his acts are just and true and is and he is able to humble the proud. Good ending. Goes from pride to humility to restored back, but a very different king. One who exalts who God is. Wow. So let's carry on. Let's read what happens. Because now at this point, Babylon is almost honouring God. God with a big G. Okay. Under Nebuchadnezzar, clearly there is going to be some defined moments of honouring God. God. That's going to be good for Babylon, isn't it? Okay, so let's see what happens with a successor of Nebuchadnezzar. Chapter 5. Many years later, King Belshazzar, Belshazzar, see that's a name I don't like, it doesn't flow well, gave a great feast for thousands of his nobles and he drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. Those are those sacred objects that I spoke about earlier. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives and his concubines. So they brought these gold cups taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. While they drank from them, they praised their idols made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood and stone. Suddenly, they saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote, and and his face turned pale with fright. His knees knocked together in fear and his legs gave way beneath him. Hands in the air if you do that, if you suddenly saw a hand writing on your wall. Oh, a lot of you are that, you wouldn't bother you, no? Wow, hardly any of you put your hands up. That wouldn't bother you. Put your hands in the air if that's going to bother you. Okay. The king shouted for the enchanters, astrologers and fortune tellers to be brought before him. He said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever can read this writing and tell me what it means will be dressed in purple robes of royal honour and will have a gold chain placed around his neck. He will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. I think I will give anything to anybody if they're going to help with this, yes? But when all the king's wise men had come in, none of them could read the writing or tell him what it meant. So the king grew even more alarmed and his face turned pale. His nobles too were shaken. Bit of a blow to the party really, wasn't it? But when the queen mother heard what was happening, she hurried to the banquet hall. She said to Balthazar, Long live the king. Don't be so pale and frightened. There is a man in your kingdom who has within him the spirit of the holy gods. During Nebuchadnezzar's reign, this man was found to have insight, understanding and wisdom like that of the gods. Your predecessor, the king, your predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar, just to clarify, it was the predecessor. She said that three times so far made him chief over all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers and fortune tellers of Babylon. This man, Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar, has exceptional ability and is filled with divine knowledge and understanding. Nebuchadnezzar just has worked so much better for me. He can interpret dreams, explain riddles and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel and he will tell you what the writing means. We'll stop there for just a moment. As I said, it'd be easy for us to start getting caught up in this ghostly hand and uh, what this ghostly hand that appeared and written these words. But I'm not for today. I think we're missing the point that's going to be made here between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar, and they're two very different approaches to God. So let's get the picture. Big party, thousand nobles, yeah? (laughs) 
Who likes a party? Who likes dancing? Okay. Who likes drinking? It's okay, you can admit to drinking alcohol. Jesus turned water into wine. It's all right. But who likes drinking soft drinks? Yeah, just, we'll clarify that. Good. So you like a good social time. You like chatting to friends, yes? Yeah, you like a good party. There's nothing wrong with a good party. It's okay. Amen? I know it's the summer holidays, but you know, you're meant to be... All right, okay. Anyway, good for a party. The core problem wasn't the party here. What the problem was for this hand to appear was Belshazzar's blatant disregard for God. Nebuchadnezzar actually was a king that when he conquered each nation still allowed the people to worship their small g God. He might have removed things from their temples and he's got a whole history of doing that. But he put those sacred objects into his own sort of treasure house and just left them there. Never abused them, never used them, left them there. And he allowed the people who he exiled out, brought to his own kingdom, he still allowed them to worship their own God. So he had sort of a sense of allowing that respectfully to happen. Unfortunately, when he came across the Jewish God, who's our God, amen? Yeah, Yahweh, he soon discovered, ah, this God's real, because <laughs> he humbled him. But he showed him respect. He was able to be respected. Belzajar, on the other hand, who should have known the history and did know the history of Nebuchadnezzar, and we're going to come to that in a moment, trampled all over God trampled all over the Lord by trying to show his overbloated confidence, his arrogance, by calling for those sacred objects, those cups, those silver and gold cups, so they could drink out of them and go, ha ha! You with me so far? Ever watch a good Viking movie? Yeah? Doing all of that showed total disregard for God whatsoever. No regard for him at all. So you could imagine, couldn't you? To try and picture the scene. So they're having a great party. We noticed earlier on that they are already had a bit to drink, hadn't they? Yeah? Yes. It says at the beginning that Belshazzar had a bit of a drink. And I think the old uh, too much thought, this is good. Look at, check this out. Got a bit OTT about it. Thought, oh yeah, bring those gold and silver cups. This is so brilliant. I want to drink this. Not just with his nobles, but with his wives and his concubines. I mean, this was absolutely trying to trample all over God. So can you imagine these fantastic cups, gold cups? Could you imagine if you get... Who's ever got like a favourite mug that you drink coffee or tea out of? Who's got a favourite one, yeah? Yeah? You love it, don't you? It just warms your heart when you look at it with the coffee and the tea in it, Yeah? Yeah, my one's a big stone version. I like, I like drinking out stone mugs, you know, sort of stone and hardware. And I absolutely love it. It's big, black things. Guinness one. Got it from Debenham. It's lovely. They go and say they're brilliant. Really big, big chunky. And I love holding it and drinking coffee out. It's brilliant. Who's then got a favourite sort of... This is a bit dangerous now. Favourite wine or <laughs> beer mug you like drinking out. But you like having them, don't you? And when you get one that just shines and glitters, so they all came out. So you can imagine, they're like, oh, poor, look at that, and guzzling even more. Well, they're trouncing all over God. Why? Because these sacred objects were only meant to be used specifically in the temple. They are something that God had dedicated. It is God who said, this is purely for me, for one thing and one thing over. It's a sacred object that I, Yahweh, possess for my very own use and worship to me. You with me? When it's a sacred object, it's something that God has said, that's mine. God is a very possessive God. Did you know that? He says, I am a very jealous God. And if God says something is his, he is jealously possessive of it. 
and he doesn't like it being mistreated. That's the holy God that we worship. I want you to hold that thought about a very holy and possessive God that we worship. Let's see what happens next, shall we? Let's see Daniel's role. 13, verse 13 onwards. So Daniel was brought in before the king. The king asked him, are you Daniel, one of the exiles brought from Judah by my predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar? I've heard that you have the spirit of the gods within you and that you are filled with insight, understanding and wisdom. My wise men and enchanters have tried to read the words on the wall and tell me their meaning, but they cannot do it. I'm told that you can give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read these words and tell me their meaning, you will be clothed in purple robes of royal honour and you will have a gold chain placed around your neck. You will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. I just want to take a note for a moment there. Daniel, under Nebuchadnezzar, as we know, got placed in high honour. Very quickly, two, by the way, um, Belshazzar wasn't the, literally the next successor from Nebuchadnezzar. There was one sort of king in between. And actually, Belshazzar probably really wasn't a king. He was more like a, uh, an oversight person. But anyway, we won't worry about it too much. So he wasn't the immediate successor. Yet, and we'll come into it in a moment, it's within, Daniel's still alive. So this is clearly, the time span's not massive. Belshazzar should have known about Daniel. Yet for some reason, he arrogantly didn't. So here you are being promised purple robe to become the third highest person ruler of this magnificent kingdom. What would your reaction be if the king called you? Eek. Okay. But it says, if you interpret this, I will put a purple robe of you on honour. Massive, this was a, a place of position, prestige and office. If you're suddenly getting called into work and you're going to be promoted, what would normally be your reaction? Excited, Excited yeah? Cool, wow, brilliant. Your boss sticks something in front of you and says, right, interpret that lot, because apparently you're wonderful and amazing. Interpret that, going to promote you. It's going to be a 100% pay rise. <laughs> oh, I could look at Timmy. Timmy's 100%. No, forget it. Anyway, 100% pay rise. You'll go, Whoa, yeah, wouldn't you? I want some of that, wouldn't you? Yes. No? Yeah. Whoever watches Undercover Boss USA? I sadly watched an episode while I eat my lunch yesterday. Great little show. Boss goes undercover to go and find out what's really going in his company. They put on the worst wigs in the world. How you cannot tell they're under disguise, I have no idea. But it's amazing how much fear can make you see things that are not really there. Anyway, and so of course this boss eventually sees these people and I wouldn't want to say it's... Anyway, and afterwards they, the boss reveals who he is. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, good, thank you. And then all of a sudden, he's clearly heard their, their problems. Nothing wrong with that. He's heard their family issue, their personal life. I've got to say, it wouldn't be the thing I would do on camera in an unknown environment, just pour out my entire heart of my entire... But anyway, that's what they do. That's great. That's fine. And they do that. And then, of course, all of a sudden, this boss wants to promote them. Brilliant. Give them $40,000. Oh, smile. Smile. Those from Canada, $40,000, yeah, a bit of all right, yeah, yeah, right, good. And he gives them, you know, new car, gave one a new car because the transmission had broke. I mean, brilliant. And tears were streaming down their eyes. I can understand that, both male and female, by the way, men. It's okay to cry. Wow, wouldn't you? So here we have Daniel being promised, do this, you get this third highest ruler of the kingdom, yeah? Wow. Daniel's response answered the king, keep your gifts or give them to someone else. 
but I will tell you what the writing means. What? Exactly. I thought you might say that, Barry. Thank you for being here. Now, could you imagine on that show, Undercover Boss, somebody going, no, it's all right. You keep it all. Who would do that? No, exactly. None of us put our hands in the air. Wow. Why is that? Because for Daniel, what he's about to do is vastly more important than anything wealth or anything can be given to him. Your majesty, the most high God gave sovereignty, majesty, glory and honour to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. He made him so great that people of all races and nations and languages trembled before him in fear. He killed those who wanted, sorry, he killed those he wanted to kill and spared those he wanted to spare. He honoured those he wanted to honour and disgraced those he wanted to disgrace. But when his heart and mind were puffed up with arrogance, he was brought down from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven from human society. He was given the mind of a wild animal and he lived among the wild donkeys. He ate grass like a cow and he was drenched with, the dr drenched with the dew of heaven until he learned that the Most High God rules over the kingdoms of the world and appoints anyone he desires to rule over them. You are his successor, O Belshazzar, and you knew all this. It's really important we get this with Belshazzar. You knew all this, yet you have not humbled yourself. For you have proudly defied the Lord of heaven and have brought these cups from his temple brought before you. You and your nobles and your wives and concubines have been drinking wine from them while praising gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood and stone. Gods that neither see nor hear nor know anything at all. But you have not honoured the God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. Well, that's a warm and fuzzy message, isn't it? So God has sent this hand to write this message. This is the message that was written. Many, many, tekel and parzin. This is what these words mean. Many means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. Notice that, brought it. Not will bring it, brought it, done and dusted. Tekel means weighed. You have been weighed on the balances and have not measured up. Parzin means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was dressed in purple robes, a gold chain was hung around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Well, he stuck to his word. That very night, Belshazzar, the Babylonian king, was killed. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. One of the things that gets me with Daniel and we all praise Daniel, that Daniel had been forgotten. He wasn't in the human limelight anymore. It took the queen mother to remember who Daniel was. Yet Daniel, though not in the hu limelight, humanly speaking, he was in God's limelight, and he was still prepared to speak for God when he was called to do so. How many of us are ready to speak for God when we are called to do so? May not be people in the limelight all the time. You may not be people who are known, but there are times that all of a sudden we are called to stand and speak for God, to speak his message of hope and sometimes to speak his message of warning. I'll come to that a bit later on. But are you prepared? It says in the Bible, always be prepared to give an answer for the hope to which we live. Yes? Are we always ready? I mean, Steve got me stuck on the M1, three hours. I've got to say, if I'm stuck on the M1 for half an hour, the last thing would not be lovely, warm, fuzzy thoughts. God, what, who do you want me to talk to here? It would be, can we get this traffic moving? But anyway... 
I'm not Steve and you're not me. So that's good, isn't it? But being prepared. Prepared, always prepared. I love Daniel's reaction. No, I actually don't want the purple robe. Give it to somebody else. It's not that important to me. Because actually what Daniel knew he was about to do was not going to be nice. It wasn't going to be a pleasant message. It wasn't going to be fun. So Daniel, I think, didn't want to be compromised by suddenly having all these great wealth and riches. Imagine if, if, if Daniel, just for a moment, as he's being promised this great prestige, thought, do you know something? I'm going to soften the blow of the message that God wants to give to him. You could do that, couldn't you? You could soften the blow slightly. He could have sort of said, well, God's saying he might number your days. You've been weighed a little bit. You're not measured up, but actually God's going to give you a second chance. So, so, so I think he's going to give you a second chance anyway. So uh, maybe you need to just maybe do a bit of repenting. That might be a good thing. He could have softened it, couldn't he? But he didn't. He didn't want to be swayed by wealth and riches and reputation. He said what God wanted him to say. And there are times, my brothers and sisters, that we have to be people like that. Sometimes we can't be soft in our message to people about God. We want to note that God did not give Belshazzar a second chance. Did you notice that? Nebuchadnezzar, he said to Nebuchadnezzar, if you read it properly, Nebuchadnezzar, you become proudful. I'm going to humble you. You will be restored, but you'll then be praising me. He actually gave Nebuchadnezzar a second chance, but he didn't give Belshazzar a second chance, did he? Now, what's the difference? I think the difference is that Nebuchadnezzar did sort of at least show some respect to, to all gods, and big G gob, he didn't trounce all over him. Belshazzar, who should have known better because of Nebuchadnezzar's story and experience, didn't, carried on trouncing all over God. What can that say to us for today? There's some of us that know better. We know the stories of our relatives. We know the stories of maybe our mum and dad and how God's dealt with them. Yet, for some reason, we haven't carried that on. And we're trouncing all over God because we're not willing to submit to him and give our lives to Jesus. Tough message. Be even tougher if we don't know Jesus. Yeah? God is a jealous God. Now, I'll come to that in a moment. God has an issue with sacred objects. Now, I actually don't believe there's a sacred secular divide, and most of us don't these days. God is everywhere, amen? amen. But God very much believes in certain things, and he takes things seriously. Some of the commentaries I'm reading, they actually, God takes things seriously. He actually, actually takes his building very seriously. Now, this is not the church. This is a building, Okay. We're the church. But God does take it seriously about how we use this building. He takes it seriously about what happens in this building. He takes it seriously how we look after this building. Amen? Amen. How we treat the Bible, the word of God. I've had some conversations with some people this week. You're here. This is not at you. And this is not a follow on from this conversation. I've already written the sermon by the time we had that. But this... This, how we treat this, the word of God, is really important, isn't it? Yes. Yeah? Yes. So important. This is where, this tells us, actually God talks to us through this primarily, yes? yes. Amen, you want to hear from God? Yes. Read this. This is a sacred object. How many of us, if we're honest, and I will talk to myself in my early days as a Christian, I wasn't always a minister, you know, we're not born with clerical collars on, right? But how many of us allow the dust to gather on top of it? Do yourself a favour one day, go home, 
and go like that. And if you can make a line of dust, I guarantee you haven't picked it up in ages. <laughs> and some of us might have 10 of these Bibles. I do. But if I don't open one of them and read it, I ain't going to do nothing, is it? This is a sacred object. We should treat it as such. It's sacred because God talks to us through it and we should be reading it every day. How many times do we go through problems and issues and because we don't read this, God can't help us? Do you know there's more in here about being encouraged in what God wants to do through you than he does having a go at you. Most of them avoid this because we think God's going to have a go at us all the time. But this is just, whoa, why wouldn't you read it? I bet you, I bet, like me, there's certain objects in your house. I don't know, nice ornament. Yeah? Who's got some nice ornaments in their house? Yeah? I bet you treat that more sacredly than this. Don't go near that, yo. Don't touch. Yeah? I bet you, you pick it up. And, excuse me, I'm just going to borrow your mug. Pick it up. Oh, must clean it. Yeah? Put it back, gently. Oh, wipe the dust off the shelf. Put it back. <laughs> Yeah, and this is closed and sitting on the bedside and you've forgotten about it until later on. Yeah? This, if you want to hear from God, is the thing to be reading. This is a sacred object. And, and, and within Christianity over the years, we talked about these, uh, we talked about God's grace and absolutely. But I think we need to learn to take certain things deadly seriously and not just say, that's all right, God's forgiving. He is forgiving. But he does say, but take this seriously. Take me seriously. To quote Wallace, we treat the church, its services, sacramental worship, if the, if, as if it had no greater significance than the coffee house or public bar. And we sometimes talk as if they had lost their, lost their significance even for God himself. How we treat coming to church on a Sunday is part of how we might look at God. Belshazzar was interesting. He got drunk and really trounced all over God. There are other people at times I know. Do you know something? And I don't advocate this as a good policy. All right, bear with me. This is not a good way of living. But I've known people for now. They drink alcohol. Do you know something? Their entire conversation is all about God and what he's done in their lives and how good he is and unpacking things. Who do you think's got the heart for God? Genuinely, the real heart for God. When you lose your inhibitions, what comes out of your heart is normally what's going on. Daniel, when he gave that message, just hung on to what God wanted and nothing else. Sometimes we need to be like that. To quote Wallace again, it appears at times a shadow side to pastoral care given in the name of God. And there be occasional rise at the rare case and the rare circumstances in which the pastor, if he is honest, has little else to do but to warn. And that goes for all of us, not just me. Times we actually have to warn our, brother, our wives and families, our people around us. Do you know something? Unless you know Jesus, you're going to hell. It's no good softening the blow anymore. So it does exist, doesn't it? Yes. Daniel told the message. God treats things very clear cut in certain ways. And that's one of them. And my last bit. Do you remember I said he treated those sacred objects and he was very possessive of them? Yes? And he said, they're set aside for my personal use. If you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Saviour, do you know you're set aside as holy? Do you know that you're set aside for God's purposes? Yes? So do you know what that means? You're sacred. Amen? And guess what that means? God's very possessive of you. Amen? Which means he loves you. Amen? Amen? So he's always with you. Yes? So he'll defend you because he's so possessive of you. Amen? Ever thought of it like that before? But when you're in the midst of trouble, do you sit there going, I'm just going to be used up like a drinking vessel and spat out? No, because God says, I love you and I'm possessive of you because you're mine. 
Amen? So if you don't know Jesus today, maybe today is the day to know him because he wants to be possessive of you. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.